has taught that the Srimad Bhagavatam is the perfect and the immaculate Brahman evidence for understanding the Supreme Truth. See Krishna. He is Daham Bandhavan. The highest method of worshipping him, <coughs> that which is embodied by the lives of the Braja Gopis. And the ultimate goal of life, that is Krishna praying. All of these things are proven. The Praman is Srimad Bhagavatam. Praman. What does it mean? The word Prama means Yatarta Gyan. Actual knowledge of reality as it is Yatarta. Yatarta Gyan. So, uh, by which sadhayati yatata jnan, that by which one attains Brahma, genuine knowledge is called Brahman. So, this Srimad Bhagavatam is Srila Vyasadeva's own commentary on Vedanta Sutra. In the Guru de Purana, there it is mentioned. Arto yam Brahma Sutra nam Bharata Neo Gati Pastarupa so Vedata Paribrimita. The Srimad Bhagavatam is the commentary. Arto yam Brahma Sutra nam. It is the explanation of each of the sutras of Vedanta. Each and every sutra of Vedanta has been explained and illustrated in Srila Vyasadeva's own natural commentary, Srimad Bhagavatam. Arto Yam, Brahma Sutana, Bharata Vinayana. And the meaning, the true meaning of the Mahabharata within that Bhagavad Gita has been fully elaborately expounded in Srimad Bhagavatam. Gati Basarupaso. And Srimad Bhagavatam explains the meaning of the Gayatri Mantra. Vedata Paribrahmita and indeed all the Vedas because all the Vedas come from Veda Mata, Gayatri Devi. So Srimad Bhagavatam is the essence of Vedanta. Sarava Vedeti Hasanam Saram Saram Samudritam It is said it is the cream of the cream of all the Vedas and histories. Sarva Vedanta Saram hi Srimad Bhagavatam isyate tadra samrita tripta syanad yadrati kvachit. Sukhadeva Goswami Bhai is saying that Sarva Vedanta Saram hi, this Srimad Bhagavatam is the essence of Vedanta. And if a person experiences the satisfaction of relishing the rasa amrita, the nectar of the ecstatic loving mellows in Srimad Bhagavatam, then that person will never feel satisfied hearing any other scripture. <laughs> Nothing else can satisfy him. Once he has relished the nectar of Srimad Bhagavatam, Sarva Vedanta Saram Yad Bharmatvai Katva Lakshanam Vastu Dvitiyam Nishtam Kaival Yaika Prayojanam Again in Srimad Bhagavatam it is said The Srimad Bhagavatam is the essence of Vedanta And that essence is characterized by Brahmatvai Katva That Brahma and Atma are one here Brahma means Krishna. And Krishna Atma is Radharani. So Radha and Krishna are one. Don't think this is a impossible philosophy. Vastvadvityanistam and the Kaivalyaika Prayojanam, the supreme goal of life is Kaivalya. That is not the oneness of impersonal 
liberation, but this guy goes in his cable of our deep brain. Vastu Adityam, Nishta, having Nishta, being fully devoted to that non-dual reality, Radha and Krishna. Yaswanu Bhava Makila Sutisara Negam Sutta Goswami gives pranam to his Gurudev Shukadev Goswami saying that he is absorbed in the nectar of realization of Sri Krishna. And that realization, Swa Anubhava Sutisara Negam, is the essence of all the Vedanta, Sutisara, the essence of the Vedas. So, What is Vedanta explaining? Yesterday we discussed the Sutra, Taka Bhattisthana. So I'll just make a quick, a brief summary of this day to refresh you. Do you remember the Sutra was in three parts? Three different people are speaking. One is giving an idea, another one is capturing, and another one, in the end of yesterday, is giving the conclusion. So, first person is saying, uh, that uh, logic, reason is inconclusive. You cannot conclude anything. And so we just have to accept what Shruti the Vedas say in regard to the fact that Bhagavan, God is the Upadankara, He is the ingredient of everything. Just as when Sri Krishna went to Mathura, he sent some messages with the Buddha to Braja Gopis. Gopis were very eager to listen. Oh, Krishna is Param Rasik. He is our lover. He is very Rasik. So he must write a very beautiful love letter. <laughs> Buddha, what did he say? Hmm? So then Buddha, he read, My dear Gopis, just as the elements are within everything and also outside of everything. <laughs> so nothing can be separated from those elements. Just as a clay pot made of clay can never be separated from the clay because it's made from the clay. So in the same way, uh, we can never be separated. God is watching it. What is this? So, this is an illustration of what it means, Upadam Karan, that God is the ingredient of reality. So, to be conscious means to be Krishna conscious. Because if you are not aware of God, there is nothing else to be aware of. So, what are you conscious of? That is only ignorance. So, the first person is saying, by logic you cannot establish anything, we just have to accept it. That God is the ingredient cause. The second person is saying, Saying no, because we can always infer the opposite. That is, if you say, by reason, we cannot come to any conclusion, that itself is a conclusion. And, if someone puts forward an argument, that actually we can come to a conclusion and you defeat him, then you then you cannot be correct. And if you did defeat him, then you're also not correct because you just removed the doubt and it was a conclusive argument. So whichever way you look at it, this, this doesn't make any sense. So now this second person, you have to understand, he's a Sankhya Bharti, a follower of the Sankhya philosophy of the philosopher Kapil Dev. Not, not our... Uh, Kapil Dev, who speaks Sankhya philosophy in the third canto of Shimon Bhakta, but an atheist named Kapil Rishi. So he's saying, no, no, we cannot accept that. Some logic is inconclusive, but some logic is conclusive. And what logic is that? Our logic of our Sankhya school. Wave the flag of Sankhya philosophy. And our philosophy disagrees that God is the ingredient cause. Because in Sankhya philosophy there are two things. 
Prakriti, the material nature, and many jivas, but no God. And these jivas are in Prakriti, and they're suffering in the endless chain of birth and death. And now, in the third part of the Sutra, Srila Vyasadeva is replying with the conclusion, Evamapi, if one accepts this idea of the Sankhya philosopher, then Anira Moksha Prasanga, then uh, moksh, Mukti, liberation, Moksha will be unattainable. So why will liberation be unattainable if you accept person number two, the Sankhya body? Because in their philosophy, there are only two things, the Jivas and Prakriti. So, if the jivas will come out of Prakriti, where will they go? Hmm? It's, it's, it's uh, obvious to us, because we know when we come out of this material world, we'll go to the spiritual world. Hmm? But in Sankhya philosophy, there's just the material world, and then there's the jivas. So, how would the jivas come out of the material world? There's nowhere to go. So, this is why Vyasadeva is saying, if we accept your idea, then there's no such thing as Mukti. And that conclusion is against the Vedas. Because the Vedas, the Shruti, speak about liberation and the state of liberation and how the soul, uh, in the Chandogya Upanishad and other Upanishads, when the soul is liberated from this world, it becomes established in a brilliant, effulgent uh, Swarup where he plays and experiences supreme bliss. Uh, so, in the Sankhya philosophy, you don't get liberated because there's nowhere to go. But they have an idea of mukti liberation for them. It is either you can be a jivan mukta or a videha. A jivan mukta is a person who in this life has realized through vivek discrimination, I am not this physical body. And therefore that's a kind of liberation because he's not suffering anymore. Because all pain and suffering is taking place in the mind. And the mind is part of the body, not the soul. The mind is part of property. So, and then the other type of liberation is when the Sankhya body who has become perfect in Sankhya dies, then he becomes Videhi, without a body. So a Videhi, a Videha, sorry, um, is not actually liberated. In their idea, he is situated in a very high level of sattva gun. He may have a body which is made of buddhi or mahat. He may have a body which is made of ahankar. He may have a body which is made of tanmatras, the subtle sense objects. But he doesn't have a, gro uh, a gross body. So he is called a videhi. And because he is very high in the mode of goodness, as Krishna said in Bhagavad Gita, that Sukha Sangye Nabhadnati, Jnana Sangye Nacharanaga, the mode of goodness conditions one to thinking, I am wise, I have knowledge, and I am happy. So though they think that they are liberated, we know that they go into a high state of Sattva Gun. In fact, Bhoja Raj, one commenter on the Vedanta Sutra, uh, the Yoga Sutras, he says that the um, Videha, they are uh, in the stage of Sananda Sampragyata Samadhi, for those who know the Yoga Sutras. And they can go higher, they can be called Prakriti Light. And they're in the stage of Sasmit, Sampragyata Samadhi. But anyway, they're not actually liberated from Maya, they're in a very high level of Sattva Gun. And their samskars, their impressions, have become latent, so they're blissful. But the latent impressions are only latent until they're not latent, until they become activated. And so they will fall down. In Srimad Bhattam, there are persons, it said, there are persons who think that they are liberated by their knowledge and by their austerities. 
but they're not Vishuddha, they're not fully transcendental. And by neglecting the lotus feet of the Supreme Lord, they fall down again when their latent sanskaras become triggered and activated again. So, therefore, in the third part of the Sutra, Vyasadeva is saying, no, we, uh, our opinion is this, that first, it is not that logic is inconclusive. And you only have to accept the Vedas. But the logic, the Tarka, which is Shastra, Shastra Sammat. Shastra Sammat, Brahma Gyan, Poshakari. Shastra Sammat, the reason which is in agreement with the scriptures hmm, is Brahma Gyan Poshakari. It nourishes your spiritual understanding. And that we accept. And we don't accept that there can be a reason which is against the Shastra as the Sankhyavadis do and we cannot accept their conclusion that God is not the, the ingredient cause of the world because then there will be Apyanir uh, Moksha, Prasangaha there will be no chance for the soul to be liberated. We can just add one more point here, and that is the Sankhyavadi is saying you can get mukti liberation from Atma Gyan, just discrimination between matter and spirit. You don't, uh, and your reason, it can contradict the Vedas. See the Baladevi Dibhushan Prabhu, he's reminding them, oh, in your own Shastra, the Sankhya Smriti, it is said, Suti Virodha Na Kruta Karaka Padasya Atma Labaha One can never attain the, the Atma Gyan, the realization of Atma, by Kutark, that means bad reasoning, which is Suti Virodha, which goes against the Sruti. Uh, so, Baladevi Dibhushan Bhavan is going the Basu is pointing out that if the Sankhyavadis say we can have independent reason which can refute this conclusion of the Vedas, your own Sankhya Shastra says that you cannot even attain your own Atma Gyan by which you think you can get liberation if you have a Kutark, that logic which goes against the Sruti. So now, now we're coming to today's subject. And yesterday we discussed how God, Supreme Lord, is a necessary truth. A necessary truth, the truth of God, can be rightfully acknowledged, you can accept it, or it can be wrongfully ignored but it cannot be rashly denied without making a statement which is self-defeating that is self it is a contradiction it is self-referentially incoherent so you cannot, cannot deny God without making a self-defeating statement and you will not even notice that you made it. Why? Due to cognitive failure. Your reasoning uh, faculty is just not working. It is malfunctioned. Because you, the buddhi has undergone a grossification and can only think in very gross terms. It cannot think in subtle terms. So, Now, according to the Srimad Bhagavatam, what is God? Bhagavan. He is Advaya Gyan Tattva. That means, He is a supreme, non-dual conscious reality. Because He is Advaita, the non-dual truth, there is nothing, there is no Swatantra Vastu. There is nothing which exists independently of Him. So, you may have noticed that it goes on the 
are sometimes theists, those who believe in God, are in a debate with those who don't believe in God. And it goes on and on and on. And they don't come to any conclusion. And there's a, one of the main reasons for this is because on many basic things, fundamental things, they actually completely agree. That's why they can't defeat each other. Because they have some fundamental agreements. What is that? The atheist thinks that there's no God. So by nature everything is independent of God because there's no God. And the theist whose mind is in duality, he also thinks that there are things which are independent of God. So actually on this they completely agree. And because God is beyond duality and there's nothing independent from Him, then actually neither the atheist or the atheist actually arguing the other side, they're both on the same side. The side of Dwandwa. Krishna said in Bhagavad Gita, Isha Dwandwa, Isha Dwandwa, Isha Dwesha Sumutena, Dwandwa Mohena Bharata. That the living beings are born into this world, afflicted with the Dwandwa, duality, dualistic consciousness, which gives rise to desire and hatred. I want this and I don't want that. And that is driving them through their karmic activities. And the root is Dwandwa. To under duality, the idea that there's something independent of God. There's a Swatantra Sattva, an ex a self, an independent, self existent entity other than God. So, this is why the debates don't come to a conclusion because they're both really on the same side. Because one person doesn't believe in God and the other person believes in a God, but his idea of God is something which isn't God. <laughs> Because he has this dwandwa, this separation between the, the world and the Supreme Lord. But the, the essential teaching of Vedanta, which makes Vedanta different from the other in the Sat Darshans, the six classical systems of philosophy, is that even those systems like Nyaya and Vaisheshik and the Yoga Sutras, which accept that there is a God, that there's an Ishwara, that there's a controller, but they consider he's only the nimittakaran, the instrumental cause of the world. But Vedanta said he is sarvakarna karnam, the cause of all causes. That means he's the formal cause, the ingredient cause, the instrumental cause, and the teleological cause. They're all causes. So, now, in modern academia, it is uh, considered to be a position of integrity to not have any position. Right? If you go to study in any university or you take part in any academic media or you read any academic book, they'll always uh, speak and write in such a way that I am just speaking from this impartial position and weighing up the different sides of the argument. Alright, that may work if you're having a discussion like a court case over something that happened just in empirical experience but God is a different subject because Vedanti the supreme truth is non-dual if you are uh, presenting a dialogue from a, the dualistic perspective you've already gone against God you understand? So the person who is writing an academic and impartial way and he thinks he's above all these people who are committed to any position, that is also a position. And it's not neutral, it's not impartial. And it is atheistic. Actually, it's also atheistic. So, uh, the academics present their idea of the world as a, the view, a view from nowhere. Hmm? Right? I don't have, I'm impartial. I have a, what's the view from nowhere? You can ask yourself. What's the view from the top of the house? What's the view from the top of a mountain? What's the view from the shore of the ocean? Hmm? Okay, now what's the view from nowhere? Nothing. If you have a view, you're somewhere. 
So there is no such thing of impartiality. So don't fall into this trap of thinking of oh, the super intellectual thing to do is not to be committed to any belief system. Because that's a belief system and it's completely fake and it's atheistic. So, now, in the seventh canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, chapter 15, verse 63, there, Bhavadvaita, that is the mood of non duality, has been described very beautifully. Karya karna vastvaikya darshanam patatantuvat avastutvar vikalpasya. Bhavadvaitam taduchate. It's the definition of Bhavadvaita. The mood of non duality. Bhavadvaitam taduchate. Bhavadvaita is called this. Karya karna vastvaikya darshanam. To see cause and effect as one. Mm -hmm. Why? Because our philosophy is Shakti Parinamavad. Krishna is Shaktiman, Supreme Lord. Omnipotent, he has all Shakti. And his Shakti transforms Parinam and becomes everything. Without him changing, he doesn't change. Yeah. Because there's a, a relation of a Chincha Veda Veda Tattva, inconceivable oneness and difference between Shakti and Shakti Mani. So Krishna remains the same, but his Shakti transforms and becomes everything. And therefore, the effect is nothing but the cause himself. But the cause is greater than the effect. Mm -hmm. you know? if, you have, if you have a bowl of soup mm -hmm. and you take some out and put it in another bowl. Now this bowl, this soup eh, is the effect of this soup. But it's not different from it, it just came from it. But it's not equal because there's only a little bit here and there's a big amount here. So cause and effect are the same, but the effect is just a, some part of the cause, not the whole. Okay? So, Brahmadvaita, Bhavadvaita, the mood of non duality, that is called Karya Karnava Stoike Darshanam, to see the oneness between uh, the cause and effects that is God and His energy. Okay? Then, Patutantavat Avastutvarvikalpasya. The idea that that the effect or the things of this world are different from the Supreme Lord is vikalpa, imagination, conceptualization. Vikalpa means a concept which is in your mind, which has no mind, in, uh, does, has no mind independent object that correlates to it exactly. You know, so in other words, you have a thought, but that thought does not correspond to anything in the real world. That's called vikalpa. So, vastutva vikalpa sya. The idea that the effect is different from the cause is imaginary. It's a conceptualization. So if you're not seeing God everywhere, it's because you're doing Vikalpa. So what is Vikalpa? If you're not seeing God everywhere, everything you're doing is Vikalpa. Understand? And the example given here is Patutantavat. Patutantavat. Pata means a cloth. And tantu means the thread. Right? So here's some cloth. I can see some thread sticking out here. So here's the cloth and here's the thread. Right? Now, which is the cause and which is the effect? The, thread the cause is the thread. The thread is the cause of the cloth. Yes. Okay, so the, the thread is the cause and the cloth is the effect. Mm -hmm. So, if I take away the thread, then will the cloth still be there? No. Why? Because the thread is the cloth. But in your mind, you are thinking there are two different things. That's called the cup. <laughs> okay? So when you become free, <laughs> you see, when you remove the thread, there'll be nothing left, which proves that the thread is the cloth, and you are thinking 
If there were two different things, and that was your vikalpa. Conceptualization, which is incorrect. So that's the way that we, the common person sees the world. And the pure devotee has bhavadvaita. The bhav of non-duality. So that is a real theist. And anyone who doesn't have that bhavadvaita uses the word God, but his God doesn't have a capital G. Or Brahma doesn't have a capital B. It's got a small G. It's, it's, a, it's an imaginary God. And this is why the theist cannot defeat the atheist, because the atheist imagines that God doesn't exist, and that theist is a, a, has a God that exists, but that God is imaginary. Right? And only those who in Bhava Dvaita know the truth. That the other two, they're just undergoing the cognitive failure. So many arguments which are full of contradictions due to cognitive failure. Now, now the question comes, can the existence of God be known through reason? So the answer is, yes. That there is a God can be known through reason. That there is a supreme being who is the cause of all existence. But we cannot know the personal details of that Supreme Being by reason. You would never figure out that God is a coward boy with peacock feather in his hair who plays a flute and wanders in the forest of Vrindavan barefoot with a complexion like a fresh rain cloud and who is, though he is all-powerful, all-knowing and omnipresent, he forgets himself and becomes completely enchanted and bewildered and becomes mad in love for Radharani. This, you, these things you cannot know yeah, by reason. We discussed that yesterday because reason extends to the regularities of the world. So the being, the being who has made the regularities is not subject to them and therefore reason will not function in regard to the Paratattva. But that doesn't mean that he's not reasonable. So he can give his own reasons for what he does, what, what, why he does what he does. Uh, and that is the, the revelation of Shastra, especially Srimad Bhagavatam. Now, in the 11th canto, chapter 28, verse 18, there it is said, Jnanam veko nigamastavas cha prachaksham aitiham atanumanam adhyanta asya deva kevalam kalascha ituscha tadeva madhye. One can develop knowledge of the truth by Vivek, discrimination, studying the Vedas, performance of austerity, pratyaksh, direct perception, aitiya, the histories, and anuma, and by inference. All of these are ways of knowing that Brahman is the final cause. So this much we can know that there is a God and that He's the final cause of all things. But the details will have to depend on Amnaya Praha, the statements of the scriptures, Guru Parampara Dwara Prakta Veda Vakya, the statements of the scriptures received through the chain of spiritual masters, the Guru Parampara, which goes back to Lord Brahma, the original being, who himself was directly Tane Pramariya Adi Kaviye Muyanti Yansura. Himself, he was directly enlightened in the heart by Sri Krishna. Now, we're coming for the, to the verse. That was the introduction to the class now. Coming to today's verse. You can repeat. Abhadito Pihyabhaso Abhadito Pihyabhaso Yathavastu Tayasmitaha Yathavastu Tayasmitaha Durgatatvad Aindriyakam Durgatatvad Aindriyakam Tadvad Arta Vikalpitam Tadvad Arta Vikalpitam Abhadito Pihyabhaso Abhadito Pihyabhaso Yathavastu Tayasmitaha Yathavastu Sorry, 
Canto 7, chapter 15, verse 58. Uh, here, our great Purva Acharya Narad Muni is in instructing Yudhisthira Maharaj. So the meaning is this. Yata means just as. Aba so a reflection. Smitaha that means um, is accepted. Vastutaya as a real object, as an independent, self-existing object. Abadita will be, even though this idea is abadita, that means completely disproven by reason. But what? In the same way. Aindriyakam. means the objects of the senses. Artha, Vikalpita, are imagined to be Artha, independent self-existent objects. Durga Tattvat, even though Durga Tattvat, it is impossible to establish such a conclusion. Even though it is, it's impossible to demonstrate that the objects we see around us are uh, independent, self-existent entities. So this is the translation of the verse. Now let's look at the the details. The first word, abadita. The word badita means oppressed, stopped. Badita means stopped, oppressed, set aside, cancelled out. And a means Completely. So, Abhadita means this idea is completely annulled, completely cancelled out by reason. Mm -hmm. So, it is, uh, it means, Tarka Virode Nasovato Bhadita, Sarvato Bhadita, completely in all respects, cancelled out. Why Tarka Virode Na? Uh, by the fact that it is Tarka road against all reasoning. So what is that which is against all reasoning? Abhas Vastu Taya that we are seeing, we are looking at the world around us. Yeah. And we are thinking, well the objects that we are seeing, they just, they just exist by themselves individually. So this is completely wrong. In the same way it's wrong, to see if the sun is reflected on a wall, a child will see the, the sun reflected on the wall and the light coming from it. And the child will think that the light is coming from this thing I'm seeing on the wall. He's thinking that reflection has its own independent existence. He doesn't understand it's dependent on the actual sun. And he's thinking that the light is coming from that thing which exists by itself. So, Srila Jiva Goswami is saying, Balad, Baladi bi kalpitaha. Baladi means like children, etc. In other words, when you're a child, your intelligence is not functioning properly. And as you grow, then gradually you can think and calculate and understand things. But a small child has no understanding. So similarly, in the same way, in this world, everyone who is not conscious, God conscious, is like a child with a malfunctioning intelligence. <laughs> because they're looking at everything around them and thinking, well, here's this thing. It's just there it is. Existing. It's self-existent. For example, if I'm playing a violin, you can hear the music. And you know this music is existent, 
it, it depends on me playing the violin, right? So the moment I stop, the music disappears. Right? But you're thinking that this thing is just sitting there, it's just existing. But it's not. It's God's energy. It's like God, everything is God's music. If God was to stop playing this note, it would disappear. <laughs> you understand? So, just in the same way as a reflection on the wall depends on the... it is the power of the sun. If the sun were not shining, it would disappear. But a child think it's in the, thinks it's independent. So in the same way, we're looking at everything and think it's just existing by itself. Just lying around here and there for us to grab and use. Everything in this world is just sitting there for us to take and do anything we want with it. But no, everything is, in one, in one sense we can say, by an analogy, by a metaphor, like God's music. When he stops playing, everything disappears. That's called the prolai, the, pro the destruction of the world. <laughs> So he creates Janamadya Sayat. He creates, he's, main, he's maintaining now everything yeah? and destroying. It's all his energy. So, therefore, it's lo it is logically impossible to describe any existence separate from Paramatma. Mm -hmm. If you're seeing anything separately from Paramatma, what are you doing? Vikalpa. <laughs> you, you're projecting the concept of independent existence on it. Now, now consider this. A modern person, they think they're so smart. They'll think, no, no, no. Everything is reducible to its parts, atoms, right? And we can agree that the forms that we see around us in the world, they're either reducible or irreducible to their parts. Now in the classical philosophy, the philosophers in, 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 in like Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, all the great philosophers from the ancient times and the medieval times, they all agree that actually forms are not reducible to their parts. Especially living things. If you're just your parts, let's take him in apart into pieces. Let's put one piece in, in a different square in the, in the room. And then let's put him back together again. What will happen? He's dead. <laughs> so, in the ancient, I, I will not go into that. In ancient philosophy and also in India, the things are not uh, reducible to their parts. In Buddhism, they're, they're considered reducible to the parts. And in Vaisheshik, that is atomic dash and uh, the atomic, Vedic atomic theory, it's not really Vedic, but uh, the theory of Kanab Rishi, they think things are made of atoms. And, uh, and the Buddhists also think things are just an aggregate of atoms. There's no real, there's no real meaning to anything. So, but, most of the ancient philosophers thought that things are not reducible to their parts. But nowadays everyone thinks that things are reducible to their parts. So we'll address that because that's the common idea. So, if you take any object, like a table, then it's self-existent. But it's reducible to its parts. What is the table made of? So this one, stone, marble, okay, what is the marble made of? Silicates, sand. Molecules, there's some carbon there, right, some carbon, some calcium maybe, oxygen, some hydrogen, there's some different things there. So, okay, what are these molecules made of? Atoms, huh? You sure? <laughs> what is atoms made of? <laughs> electrons. <laughs> protons. What are these electrons and protons made of? Electricity. Quarks. 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 Quarks
Crocs, new ones, blue ones, both ones. <laughs> okay, just go on and on. Especially if you're in Switzerland, you can go to the sun, and to the body will be an accelerator and try to discover the God. <laughs> right, the last thing. But they, they haven't come to the last thing. Right? But the thing is that the, if you try to explain objects in terms of them being divisible into components, smaller and smaller parts, how far does it go? Can you go on forever? Is it, it, are things infinitesim, uh, infinitely divisible? Or is there a last thing? Huh? <laughs> you don't know? <laughs> so it, it, cannot be, it cannot go on forever. There has to be a last thing. Because if there's not a last thing, there wouldn't be a, a first thing. <laughs> huh? i give a very simple example. You're standing in a queue to buy a loaf of bread. So you're in the back of the queue and the people in front of you are buying their bread and leaving. So finally you get to the front of the queue and say, I'd like to buy a loaf of bread. So then the shopkeeper says, I'll sell you bread, but you have to get a ticket from that line first. <laughs> and then you look to your right and there's another line. So you're getting that line and you're waiting when you get to the front. Can I have my ticket? I'll give you a ticket, but you have to get a ticket from that line first. And then you, and then you look, how many lines are there? And you look and you see the lines going on and on and on and on and on and on. You can't see the end of it. Now the question is, you have this question that comes in your mind. Do these cues go on forever or is there a last one? Does it end somewhere? What's the answer? Is there an end? Yes, why? If not, it keeps going on and on. There is, uh, then you, one can bread. never buy a bread. <laughs> yeah. Because the people in front of you in the queue, they were taking their bread, right? Yes. So it cannot go on forever, otherwise it never arrived there. So in the same way, <laughs> the reducibility of objects, it cannot go on forever. Otherwise there would be nothing here now. And so it has to stop somewhere. So there's a last thing. So in in uh, in uh, the philosophy of Buddhists and in uh, the Vaisheshik philosophy, it is said that that is called the atom. And don't mix it up. What we call the atom, it's divisible. But in this uh, philosophy of Vaisheshik and and Buddhism and other philosophies, who believe in the atom. The atom means whatever the last particle is which is indivisible. The very last thing, the fundamental, foundational particle. That just cannot be divided anymore. It's the last thing that is called paramanu. The paramanu. Okay. Now, in the fifth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, there, Jada Bharat is explaining to Raghugan Maharaj, you know the history? Jad Bharat is a completely liberated soul. He's absorbed in the joy of the self, and self and supreme self. So such a person is so, such in ecstasy, they have no bodily consciousness at all. Just like a drunk person doesn't know when he's drunk and lying on the ground with rolling eyes. He doesn't know whether his shirt is on or off. <laughs> So in the same way, such a Paramahamsa doesn't know whether his own body is on or off. Uh, he's just in the great bliss of God-realization. Uh, you have to come to that stage. <laughs> that's why you're chanting Hare Krishna every morning in Japan. <laughs> we have to rise up out of that, the gunas, the mode of ignorance and passion, which makes us identify with the body. To sattva and beyond sattva. And there is only joy in the eternal service of Sri Krishna and no bodily identification at all. So Jan Bharat is, he is a great personality in such consciousness. And uh, there was a king and his, one of his palanquin carriers was um, could not do the, his job. They needed a, he fell ill, so they needed a new person to do 
this service. So they, they oh, they found this crazy person, but he looks strong, let's <laughs> recruit him. So they recruited him, and he was carrying the palanquin. But as he was going, he looked, he saw ants, and he didn't want to step on the ants. So he was stepping in a regular way here and there. Not like the others. I don't know if you've seen palanquin carriers in India. If you go to the festival Chandan Yatra in Jagannath Puri, there the deities of Madan Mohan come out from the temple carried on a palanquin and the palanquin carriers are standing with their chest almost touching the back of the next person and they're marching like a centipede. All the legs are moving. So, but he was not moving in time. And because of this, the palanquin was rocking. And the king became angry. He jumped down from the palanquin. He said, oh, Why can't you carry it properly? Is it because you're so lean and thin? He was actually very strong. I know it's because you're lean and thin and because you've been carrying it for so long. He just joined a few minutes ago. And it's because you've been, it's so heavy and you've been carrying it for so long and you were so weak. This is why. So the king was speaking all sarcastic things which were the opposite of the actual situation. John Bharat, he said, What you are saying is true. Because when you said, I am lean and thin, what you meant to say, I am very stout and strong. Hmm? When you said, I am lean and thin, you were saying, I am not stout and strong. So it's true, I am not stout and strong. Though you are saying me stout and strong. I am not stout, why? I am not this body. Hmm? I haven't been carrying it for a long time. Why? I am not the doer. The soul is not doing anything. Uh, he's not doing the activities of the material world. He's a doer in relationship uh, to uh, to God. And he becomes a doer in this world when he identifies with the false ego. But Jack Bharat has no false ego. So, in this way, Jack Bharat began to speak very beautiful siddhant and the king was amazed. He said, who are you? Are you Kapil Rishi? That's where I was going on my palanquin to meet Kapil Rishi. I wanted to learn philosophy from him. And, but is it by chance that I met him already? Are you that Kapil Rishi? Are you Abhi Kami Antariksha Prabhupada Pibalayan? Chamasa Karabhazan? Drumil? Are you one of the Navi Yogendras? Bharat Maharaj said, no. He said, have you heard of a king named Bharat Maharaj? No. Rabugan said, ah oh, yes, he's in my dynasty. <laughs> he was a king in ancient times. And when he was still quite young, he was the emperor of the world, but he renounced everything and went to the forest and did sadhan to attain his perfection. And Jack Bharat said, oh, I was that Bharat Maharaj. <laughs> Then Rahugan was uh, astonished and he fell on the ground down the van perhaps. <laughs> and then Bharat Maharaj is instructing. That is Jan Bharat. He was Bharat Maharaj before, then he was a deer, then he became Jan Bharat. So Jan Bharat is instructing Rahugan Maharaj. He's saying here, Evangi Ruktam Shitishabda Pritam Asandidana Paramanavo Ye. Vijaya vid, avidyaya mana sakaupita ste yesham samuhena prito vishesha. The meaning is atoms are avidyaya mana sakaupita ste. They are uh, kalpana, cognitive constructs. They are creations of your mind that have no reality, which are avidyaya. Avidyaya manasakalpita state. The mind has imagined this thing called the atom due to ignorance only. Now, that's the conclusion of Srimad Bhagavatam. That 
you think that things can be reduced down to some final part, but that is only imagination. Why? So the answer, the, the reason has been given in the 12th canto, 12th canto, chapter 4, verse 29. Vikara kya yamano pi pratyakat mana mantara nani rupi ustanura pi shat shat chit sama atma vat. This is a very beautiful verse. It means Vikara kya yamano pi. What you are seeing in this world is the transformation of the elements. But nothing can be explained. Nani rupi Nani rupya asti. Nothing can be explained pratyaka atmanam antara independently of paramatma. Hmm? Let's say you have the element earth. Earth is the same thing. Why has it assumed so many forms, a multiplicity of forms? Trees, rivers, birds, human beings. The, the element itself is the same. Where did the multiplicity of forms come from? If you have one thing, it makes one thing. Right? If, you, if you have a, a bowl of porridge, you throw it on the floor, it will just be, just be a pile. Right? Do it again. It will just be a pile. Do it a thousand times. Oh, the statue of the boy David by Michelangelo. No. No. Never going to happen. Same thing, we'll make the same thing every time. How is it possible that the varieties of forms have come about? So he's saying here, it is stated that no form can be explained without reference to Paramatma. And if someone says, Narupyas to Anurapi. If someone says, well, no, we can break whatever form is there, we can break it all down to the atom. And that's the explanation, that's the fundamental particle behind it. Then, Shacha Chittama Atmavat, then we say no. Why? Because that final particle itself would be non different from Paramatma. That final particle would be conscious and it would be. No, Atmavat, non different from Paramatma himself. Now you may not follow that. Why? Pramanda. Cognitive failure. Why is it if you break something down and you get down to the last and this last thing which is there must be Paramatma? And it can be just some. Whatever. Just, you know, when you're a kid and you learn chemistry, you have these balls and you join them together with sticks. Mm -hmm. Like that, right? Why can't it just be like one of those balls joined together with sticks to some other balls? Like that. That's just imagination. A model in the mind. So, why would that last thing be Paramatma? So, the answer is this. That... If something has a shape, that shape can come from the parts it's made of. But if you divide it down, down, down and you come to the last part, the shape of that last part cannot be the result of its parts because it doesn't have any parts. Understand? If you build it, if you make a house, it's square and it has corners because the bricks are square and they have corners. Right? So the form of the house depends on the shape of the bricks. The la in this analogy, the last part of the, of the house, let's say. So, the form depends on the shape or the form of the, of the last thing. But when you get down to the last thing, what, its form cannot depend on its parts because it doesn't have any parts. Okay? It's clear. Now, if this last thing has no parts, then what is its form dependent on? Only itself. Only itself. And therefore, it, because its form cannot be explained in terms of parts in a mechanistic way, the form that it has is dependent upon itself. It is like that because it wants to be like that. Hmm? 
We have a habit. We, if the materialistic mind cannot stop breaking down like a machine, mechanical, 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 everything's made of its parts, and, we, and that's just like a program that won't stop running. But when you, when you, if you're coming down to the last thing, which is not made of parts, anything that's called simple, in Sanskrit it's called akanda, indivisible. That which is indivisible is called akanda, and in Western philosophy it's called a, a simplex, that which has no parts. So the form of that which has no parts depends upon itself. So if something is the cause of its own form, that means the desire of that thing is reality. So that entity whose desire is reality is omnipotent and, and that's God and it cannot be anything other than God understand so uh, in the, the the mind which is afflicted with ignorance with Brahm is always trying to break things down break things down break things down break things down but it does not think of what it means to be something which is akanda, irreducible. But something which is irreducible must be there. Something which is self-existent. And the qualities of a self-existent form are never examined by the cognitive, due to cognitive failure. That the thing which is self-existent is totally different from a thing which is as a dependent existence and which is irreducible. That's just not considered. So, Form is discontinuous, what is called discontinuous. Let's say, if you play a note on a violin, you can slide your finger on the string. And, or on a guitar, you can bend the string. So the note goes... Uh, it can slide up and down. So that it's continuous. It's not a set of notes, it's a continuous note. But you can draw on a graph you know, a charge of time and distance and make a continuous line for acceleration. That's continuous. But, what is discontinuous? A note on a piano. Right? It's just bing. And there's no, it does not run to the next note. There's a gap and then there's something else. So form itself is discontinuous. What are the stages that lead from no form to form? Show me, explain to me scientifically, step by step, the stages between something not having a form to having a form. What are the stages? None. None. It's discontinuous. That's why Nirvishesh Brahman, impersonalism cannot be the cause of the world. Because there's no stage between formlessness and form. Understand? So form is discontinuous. So because form is discontinuous, it must exist because an intelligence said fiat lux. Huh? That means in, in Latin, let there be light. And things are the way they are because God said, let there be light. According to his intelligence, it has been made. Because there are no stages between formlessness and form, because form is discontinuous. Now, this is described in the third canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. Third canto, uh, chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. Itita sam sushaktinam satinam asamityasa prasukta loka tantranam nishamya gati mishwaraha. Creative powers, the energy of God, the Mahat. It was in a dormant state and thus incapable of bringing forth the cosmos. This is the beginning of creation. The potential energy, Pradhan became Prakriti, that means the three Gunas are there in equilibrium, and then the Mahat came, the first element. And then from this element came the other elements, but the elements themselves were not mixed together. They were in a dormant state and therefore incapable of bringing forth the cosmos. At that time, the Supreme Lord, Paramatma, assumed his divine potency called time and simultaneously entered into the 23 categories. That means Mahat, 
uh, uh, buddhi, ahankar, manas, and the uh, sense objects, and the senses, and the gross uh, uh, elements. So he entered into all of the elements by the medium of his active potency, Cheshtarup, and awakened the dormant karma of the jivas. He combined the elements together and manifested the world. So as we were giving the example to porridge, we'll just... One substance will just make one substance. So how will Earth make all the various things? So, it is because the Supreme Lord, it is the Paramatma that enters into everything and then manifests them. So, they're actually all His forms. And that's why it's called the Virat Rup, the universal form of the Lord. This is what the world is. It's good to know where you are. Where are you, Dijon? <laughs> no, you're, you're situated within. The universal form of the Lord, that's all there. Nothing can be explained without the Paramatma. Because there is no independent existence. But just like a child sees the reflection of the sun on the wall and thinks this is its own reality, we are looking at all objects and thinking that they're, it's their own independent separate reality. And we don't see Paramatma. Now, we're coming to the question, why is it that people don't understand these principles? I've just explained all these things clearly, step by step, and you all understood it. It was not too difficult. It was not too challenging. You all understood it. But why is it that you didn't understand it previously? And why is it not obvious to the common person? Because once you hear it, then it's obvious. That's what this verse is saying. Avaritopi. Even though it's completely against logic to think that any object exists independently, has its own independent self-existence. It's just childish. But still, everyone thinks that things do exist independently. So why is that? So, that is because of the defects that arise in from ignoring God. When we are in the state of Bahimukata, our consciousness is turned away from God. We're indifferent to God. We have no inclination to know or to serve God. Then one becomes covered by Maya, the mature energy. When one is covered, then the consciousness begins to, the chitta begins to condense. It becomes, the chitta becomes ego. The ego becomes manas and buddhi, mind and intelligence. And this uh, condensed chitta in the form of the contaminated intelligence is very gross. It cannot think in subtle ways. And so these um, defects appear in the consciousness of the living being beginning with Brahm that is the tendency to be in illusion. Then pramada, the inability to understand the subject due to the grossification of intelligence or the inability to concentrate. Vipralipsa, confirmation bias due to not accepting anything that doesn't have something in it for you, some gain. Remember yesterday we were speaking, lipsa means for gain. And then finally karnapatav, then we identify with the body and think that our senses are the only means of knowing things. And those senses are limited and imperfect. So we'll see what Srimad Bhagavatam says about the first one, Brahm. Brahm. So, this is 7th Canto, chapter 15, text 61. Narad Muni's instructions to you, this dear Maharaj. You know, there are many histories in Srimad Bhagavatam. Like we're just hearing about Bharat Maharaj. And everyone knows the stories. Bharat Maharaj was a king. He was doing austerities. He got it, became attached to a deer. At the end of his life, he remembered the deer, he became a deer. Then in that life, he did more austerities. 
and in his day life, then he left that body and took the body of a Brahmin, but in that life he pretended to be deaf and dumb and mad, so he wouldn't be involved in any social interactions. And, and uh, then some Dakoids captured him, they wanted to do a human sacrifice to Kali, but Kali burst out of the deity and killed them all. The, the stories we know, it's all action-packed and interesting. But these stories are the vehicle through which these discussions are being presented, actually. So, but the, the habit is very often that the devotees they read the action and they get to all these verses like, <laughs> when's the next action coming? And that's not really studying Srimad Bhagavatam. <laughs> if you want to understand Srimad Bhagavatam, you have to come and sit at the feet of a Vaishnava. And then, otherwise, you'll be reading it and what will happen? Vipralipsa. Uh, this verse is not entertaining for me. I'm not gaining anything from it. Let's skip over those verses <laughs> and get to the action that's more. I'm gaining some entertainment value. Right? So, Brown, Pramada, Vipralipsa. With our conditioned state, even though the Shastra is true, but we completely mangle it due to our own defects. And that's why Jaha Bhagavata Pada Vaishnavarasthane. One has to hear Srimad Bhagavatam the Granta Bhagavat, from the Bhakta Bhagavat, from the devotee who is the embodiment of the transcendental knowledge of Srimad Bhagavatam. So, here, Nargun is saying, Satsa Drishya Brahmasthavad Vikalpe Sati Vastuna Jagrat Swapo Yata Swapne Tata Viti Nishedata What number verse is this? Yes, correct. Because you will all go and you may forget. But she will not forget. She will not did everything. You can watch it on online afterwards and make notes. So here, Nadrish is saying, as long as a person has a doubt in regard to the real self-existent entity that is Paramatma. And as long as you have doubt in Paramatma, then the delusion of sameness of separate identity remains. That is called sad Sadrisha Brahm. So here Brahm is an, a delusion, a misunderstanding an illusion. And what kind of Brahm is it? Sadrisha. Drisha means that which is seen. And sa in the here means the same. Sadrisha. That you're seeing the same thing. A room full of blank stairs. <laughs> Sadrisha Brahm is the illusion of thinking you're seeing the same thing. Okay, I'll give an example and then you can understand whether or not you are affected by Brahm. <laughs> Have you yeah, seen, there's a river nearby, right? Yes. Yeah? Have you seen that river? Yes. yes. What's the river? The name. What is it called? Lush. How many times have you seen it? <laughs> Many times. You sure it was the same river, not different river? Yeah, it's a different water. <laughs> you see, in your mind, you are thinking, no, this is the same river, I've seen it so many times. But you have never seen the same water twice. And what is the river? It's just the water. The river is the water, and you've never seen the same water twice, and you're thinking, I've seen this river so many times. <laughs> Eh? Um, let me say a thing. Krishna gives an example also. 11th canto, chapter 22, verse 45. See, Krishna is saying, So yam so yam pumaniti nirnam grisha gidhe mrisha yosham. The discrimination, the faculty of discrimination, and the faculty of speech of those persons 
who are living futile lives. They are all false. Person who is not God conscious is living a futile life and everything they think and everything they say is false. Why? Because they say of a human being, oh, this is the same person I met yesterday. Just as they make claim that, oh, this is the same river or this is the same light. You know, if there's a candle and the light is shining and you see it, you look away, you look back, oh, it's the same one, I've seen that before. Right? But that flame of the candle is not the same flame. If you zoom in on it with a microscope, you'll see there's millions of reactions going on. But from far away, you're looking and think, seeing this uh, light in the shape of a teardrop. Right? So you've seen this light in the shape of a teardrop and that's the light. Have you seen it before? Yeah, I saw it earlier. But you never saw it earlier. It's different, 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 different all the time. So, some things are different. In this world, some things are different. Some things are the same, right? Wrong. <laughs> Everything is different all the time. Everything. But you think that it's the same. And especially, we apply this to our body. I have the same body I had yesterday. Maybe a bit fatter. <laughs> a bit thinner. A bit taller. Shorter. More wrinkles. Whatever. But it's the same. So, yeah, this, I, this first Brahm is that we have it is called the Sadrasya Brahm. The idea of thinking that all objects are the same. Not the same as each other, but it's we're seeing the same objects repeatedly again and again. Sadrashabra. And included in the idea of Sadrashabra is also <coughs> the idea which is called Aikya Bhuti Alamban. Aikya Bhuti Alamban Rup. The idea that this is a isolated, unique whole. Here's a table, here's a chair, here's a house, here's a bookcase. These are all isolated, unique holes. But, you know, there's a saying, ashes to ashes and dust to dust. The earth is there, it transforms, becomes the food. And then you eat the food, it becomes your body. And then you die and your body goes back into the earth. Like this. So everything is in a flux. All the forms, they're not stable. Because they're always changing. And they're never really independent from the other things. It was earth and now it came made into the shape. And it went back there. It was always earth. It was... Never really anything other than the earth. So, the one Brahm that we have is Sadrasya Brahm, that we have the sameness of things. The other is Aikya Buddhi. That means in our intelligence, in our Buddhi, we say Aikya, this is one isolated thing, disconnected from other things. And then the next one is called Swatantra Satta. This thing is not only not changing, it's the same thing I saw yesterday. This thing is not only not a part of everything else, but it, it's an individual object uh, in its own right. But it also has Swatantra Satta. It is self-existent. It's existing by its own power. So, these are the three types of Brahm. And we are, because our intelligence has become grossified, when you turn away from God, then the, the intelligence becomes gross, and naturally, these three types of Brahm appear. Sadrishya Brahm, Aikya Buddhi, and Swatantra Satta. These three types of Brahm, they constitute the fundamental components of what is called Pritag Dristi. 
that things are separate and independent from God. So that they compose the, they comprise the uh, essence of dwandva, the experience of duality. The reality is <coughs> divisible when actually reality is advaita. So without these three, sadrasya brahm, aiku buddhi alamban rup, and swatantra satayaha. Sataya, this is in the plural here. That means a multiplicity of self-existent entities. You see, it's not that there are no self-existent entity. entity. There is, that's God. God is the only self-existent entity. But when we think there is Swatantra Sataya, that means a multiplicity of self-existent entities. Now we've made a mistake. There's only one self-existent entity and everything else is depending on the existence of that one self-existent entity. Now, without these three types of Brahm, then atheism would be impossible. Because the cognitive failure that is Pramada that enables atheism would not occur. Understand? If you don't have Brahm, then when you think about the world, you will not have this uh, pramada. Uh, you will not uh, misunderstand. The reason we are misunderstanding everything is because this Brahm is there. In other words, Brahm is like the first level of our conceptualization is wrong. And then all our other thoughts are taking place on top of that level. You understand? So when you have these three types of Brahm there, that's basically there. Happens as soon as you forget God. And now, on the basis of those three types of Brahm, you think and do philosophy. In other words, you're doing your philosophy on a basis which is not substantial. As Jesus Christ said, the wise man built his house upon a rock. <laughs> the fool built his house upon the sand. It fell down. So, all of the ideas of the common person, they are Pramada. They're all wrong. We've just shown it. But they don't, that is pramada. But they don't understand how it's wrong because all their thoughts are on the basis of brahm. So brahm, pramada. Now because of this brahm, then you think, well my body is a self-existent entity which continues to exist throughout time. Right? And, that, and then, and that's the basis of the bodily conception. Right? So when you say, I'm not, it's easy to say, I'm not the body. But as long as you have Sadrishya Brahm, Aikya Buddhi Alamba, and the uh, Swatantra Sattaya, these three types of Brahm, then you say I'm not the body, but you totally feel like you are, and you believe that you are, actually. <laughs> really. Right? <laughs> Think about it. Consider it very carefully. So, now, if these th uh, three types of Brahm, which are the components which make us experience duality, hmm, were not there, there would not be any atheism. And all of this happens, all of these misconceptions happen just because of one thing. That is, the ignorance of Paramatma. That's all. You see, everything seems to have its own independent existence. Why? Because Paramatma is present in everything and he has his own independent existence. The elements could not make anything. He entered into them and all the shapes are his shapes. All the forms are his forms. And he is self-existent, independent. But he's not a multiplicity, he is one. And because he's self-existent, his presence gives the impression that all the objects are self-existent when we ignore him. And so, uh, therefore it is said, Sarva Bhuteshu Yapasyat Bhagavat Bhavamatmanaha Bhutani Bhagavat Tatman Esha Bhagavat Otuma The definition of the Uttam Bhagavata, who sees 
the Supreme Lord in every living entity. And sees every living entity in the Supreme Lord. And who sees his own power also in others. He thinks that everyone has love except for me. He is called the Uttam Bhagavata. And this is why Krishna has also said, Parasubhava Karamani Na Prasansati Nindati. Don't criticize the um, qualities and activities of others. And don't praise them also. You can praise Guru and Vaishnavas. But materialistic persons, we don't blame them and we don't praise them either. Huh? Why? Because that means you have forgotten everything is Paramatma to blame. And you, just as you are identifying yourself with your body, you are identifying them with their body and forgetting God. And so the principle of criticism, not criticizing others, is favorable to Bhakti because the principle of criticizing others is non different from the being in a state of obliviousness to the presence of God. Understand? So this is why Mahaprabhu said, Trinada peace unijena, Tarora peace is una, Amani na manade na kitanya sada. Give respect to everyone, don't expect respect for yourself. And chant continuously. If we are chanting, even if you are chanting continuously, but you say, oh, this one is bad and this one is like this. You are trying to realize God and at the same time destroying the, your own possibility of realization. Understand? So, the Konishta Adhikari's faith is soft. It gets interrupted. The Madhyam Adhikari, he has strong faith, but he has not fully made the connection between Shastra and Yukti, the scriptures and the reasoning, or the reasoning of the scriptures also. But the Uttam Adhikari, Shastra Yukti Sunipun, Dhritashtra say Uttam Adhikari Jagatanishta. For him, scriptures make perfect sense. And his sense is in perfect agreement with the scriptures. So his faith is very strong, uninterrupted. Jagatanishta. He has the power to deliver everyone in the world. Jagatanishta. Because he can remove all their doubts and enlighten them. By his words and association. So in this way, we have uh, tried to give a presentation on the subject of faith and reason. Gaur Prema. So, it was not complete, but just a look inside. We will complete, in two classes, we have completed the subject. Now, our weekend is on practical spirituality. When a person has developed faith, faith comes. Now it becomes, it's, it's soft faith in the beginning. But that faith is faith in Takoji. The vigor serving the deity. So this evening, we'll continue on the subject. After discussing faith and reason, now we're coming to the nature of faith and how the preliminary faith is all based on appreciating and serving Krishna in his deity form. <laughs> Krishna, you're just undergoing some uh, cognitive failure, that's all. <laughs>